announcement. On today's call, we have some of the most fascinating entrepreneurs, teachers, investors, school leaders, researchers, media, philanthropists, nonprofits, and policymakers at both the state and federal level. We're so glad you could be with us. We had 329 RSVPs for today, which is a new record. And I credit our wonderful guests for drawing you all in for this interesting conversation. Before I introduce those guests, I'd like to give you a three minute update on the work of the EdTech Evidence Exchange. Our nation's schools collectively spend tens of billions of dollars per year on education technology with high hopes that it will support great teaching and learning. But a majority of this technology is then barely used or not used at all. And this chronic dysfunction harms huge numbers of kids and disproportionately impacts our students of color. The reason this problem persists and is getting worse is that our nation's educators have no idea what works, where, why, or under what circumstances, or how to most effectively implement technologies in their own contextual environments. Our schools are trapped in this information vacuum due to a collective action problem. Every school wishes that every other school would carefully document and share its feedback about thousands of ed tech products. But it's economically irrational for any individual school to do so. And as a result, our educators continue to make high stakes decisions in the dark without understanding what their peers are doing and what they're learning. We, the nonprofit EdTech Evidence Exchange, were created to gather, analyze, and disseminate feedback from eventually hundreds of thousands of educators. Our goal is to create a place where they are incentivized and supported to document their work and describe their contextual environments so that we can help educators learn from each other at scale. Before we could build and operate this platform, we need to create common language to describe how our schools are similar and different from each other. And I'm pleased to report that the work we've done over the last two years called the EdTech Genome Project is now complete. We have reached a major milestone with the publication of the final report that demonstrates national consensus on how we can all detect and measure the ways in which our schools vary from each other. These new measurement instruments are the backbone of the EdTech Evidence Exchange platform that is now partially developed and nearing its conclusion. We have started to validate our measurement instruments in the field, and we are working towards solving these collective action problems by beginning to collect feedback from educators with a focus beginning now on K-8 math. Our main issue going forward is that collective action problems are only solved in two ways, either by government or philanthropy. I'm sure none of you owns your own snow plow to plow your part of the public street. That's something where we count on the government to collect taxes and then hire workers to buy snow plows to clear the streets. In our education system, we have over 100,000 schools in our country split into more than 14,000 school districts that each operate largely independently. They need support and information at a scale that over the long term, only our federal government can support. So for now, we are funded entirely by philanthropy to do this work on behalf of the common good. As you'll read in the final report of the EdTech Genome, which I hope you'll take a few minutes to look at, we are kicking off our search for funding for the next phase of our work, and we would be delighted to have your support and help as we do so. Our work has been in the news lately. Ivy has pasted a few or will be pasting a few uh, articles into the chat if you'd like to learn more about what we do, our research and our collaborations. There should be a link to the final report to the EdTech Genome Project, as well as a press release about our collaborations with Project Unicorn, Digital Promise, ISTE, the Center for Education Market Dynamics. 
Soon, we will be announcing partnerships with the first three states that we have selected where we will be collecting feedback from thousands of educators this school year, paying each of those educators a meaningful cash stipend in exchange for them spending time with us to tell us about their contextual environment and to tell us detailed feedback in a standardized format about the ed tech products that they're using. And now on to the main event. Julia Fallon is the executive director of the State Educational Technology Directors Association, known as CETA, where she works with US state and territorial digital learning leaders to empower the education community to leverage technology for learning, teaching, and school operations. Prior to joining CETA in January of 2021, she worked for Washington State's K-12 Education Agency as the Title II Part A program lead, where she provided operational leadership on, uh, and oversight of the federal program designed to improve the quality of instruction and administration. In her new role, she's focused on improving digital learning opportunities for all students, collaborating with members and other peers nationally through CETA initiatives and engaging with the broader education and policymaking communities to advocate for leveraging effective technology to support students no matter where they live. Chris Rush serves as a senior advisor to the Secretary for Innovation and Educational Technology at the US Department of Education. He also co-founded New Classrooms Innovation Partners, a nonprofit focused on new instructional models, including the School of One personalized learning program which was named one of Time Magazine's top 50 inventions of the year. There, he has served as chief program officer overseeing model design, build and nationwide school implementation, as well as de facto COO and president overseeing all strategic and day-to-day -day organizational activities. Chris most recently also worked in the New York City Department of Accountability in the Department of Education, where he co-led and salvaged the troubled design and development of a $95 million achievement reporting and innovation system. And he has also launched consulting services at Amplify, uh, worked in financial management and IT at IBM, founded a pair of tech startups, and taught earth science for the Upper Dublin, Pennsylvania School District Environmental Center. Uh, Let's jump right into the questions uh, by framing the issue with some historical context. Over the last 50 years, oh, first, welcome. Hi, Chris. Hi, Julia. Hi, Bart. Uh, so glad that, uh, that you could be here with us. Over the last 50 years, technology has revolutionized nearly every sector of our economy. Meanwhile, we spend all this money on school technology with very little evidence that the investment is having a detectable impact. Um, most other sectors of our economy benefit from tens of billions of dollars of basic research and development through the Federal Institutes of National Health, NASA, and the Science Foundation, but there's virtually no federal R&D funding. Should that change? And if so, what do you think it could lead to? You want to take this one, Chris, to start? I mean, he started out with the big, the big question, very like right at <laughs> the go here. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, sure. So I think overall, there is very little spent on education, R&D, or at least the innovation part of it. You're absolutely right. I mean, there is more spent on video game development uh, over the course of a single year than all of education R&D. And that which is spent on it is largely spent on the basic research part of it, very little emphasis on the development or innovation aspect of it. And what I found is this comes into what you believe fundamentally about the current state of education. There is general agreement that it's not working sufficiently for everyone uh, at this point. But I think there are different assumptions about the root cause of that. There are some that believe the educational system needs improvement, but that the model doesn't, that we know how to do school because so many people who are in positions of power and authority went to school and have been successful and they have found a way to make school work 
for their kids. In which case the focus is how do we put the rules in place? How do we have more accountability? How do we have more effort to make sure that the model of school is happening quote unquote correctly in all these different places? And in that version of the world, if you believe that to be true, then there's not a lot more of investment that needs to be made in education R&D. However, if you are in the other camp who believes that there is a model out there and it works for some, but not all, and it doesn't matter how much you try to put the accountability in place, but that you actually need to have some alternate models, some alternate tactics, some alternate tools out there, then there does need to be money to invest into that space. And I think we could see a lot of advancement either way. Personally, I'm one who believes that one size fits all isn't the answer and that there is a need uh, to invest in, evol in evolving uh, the learning model and to have multiple options available. And I think it would be helpful. And I'm gonna echo um, what Chris said, but also add that um, sometimes I feel like our system is also disconnected from the practices that we are actually trying to teach the content, right? So as practitioners, we're not, if I'm a chemistry teacher, what am I doing to bring in what chemists are doing every day? And, and do I have those skills to kind of mimic that so I could also be showing what kind of careers are available um, and, and, and the research that's going on. It's almost like we get static. Once you go through your teacher prep program, you're kind of static and then you're not encouraged to actually become almost like that action research practitioner constantly and everything else because there's just so many competing different priorities. And again, it goes back to people know what they know and they they haven't changed. They, they can't envision what it would look like differently. Um, and everything else. So I think that's kind of where we're at. It's those two camps and a lot of people are in that, that first camp that Chris had described. Thank you. How would you guys describe federal policy towards ed tech over the last 10 years? What has its focus been and how has that policy stance impacted the adoption, use and impact of ed tech in our schools? I was going to I'm going to say here um, just uh, in this in the spaces, it feels like we did a, um, not to like um, perpetuate George Bush's mission accomplished, but there was this kind of mission accomplished under No Child Left Behind, like we've done it and we're done and we're just going to go on. Um, and then the funding went away. Right. We know that in 2011, uh, NCLB ceased to fund Title II Part D, which was specifically for effective use of technology. Um, and then the states, obviously, that thought that was a priority continued to pour money into that. And some states decided to level set or some states decided to abandon um, those efforts. Um, but we found during the pandemic, uh, we should have been continuing to invest, right? Because those states that actually continue to invest their own dollars actually, I think, fared better in the pandemic than those that just said, well, we don't have any money to do this and it's not a priority for us. We have other things going on. They kind of just did what they did. So um, I think that the federal policy right now, I feel like on the connectivity and the access side, we, with the pandemic has really made that a reality, right? We thought it was a pipe dream that we would connect all homes and making sure that all students were connected once they were off our campuses. But I can see that happening in policy, though, it'll probably take a little while longer, but I can see that in terms of professional learning um, and changing practitioner stuff. That's a hard thing to, to put into policy. And, and again, it goes back to the, the first question, right, is if you believe the model isn't broken, why would you change anything? So um, and, and, you know. Policy is like watching grass grow. Um, for those of us that love it, we love watching the grass grow. For other people, they're very impatient about it. It takes a long time. <laughs> Chris, you're, you're at the department now. What's yeah. your view of federal policy over the last 10 years? Presumably you joined because you think we need some new, different, more, better policies. Well, I think the policy hasn't been consistent over the last 10 years, right? If you rewind 10 years, um, you know, in the Obama administration, there was a big focus on, there were programs like Race to the Top and I3 that were driving some innovative solutions, largely, I think more in the classroom um, and, in the, and in schools, trying to drive that forward. I think after those programs, we really saw a bit of falling off. Um, and some of that, there was still some money that was put towards it, but not to the degree that had been put forth in the Obama administration. And of course, once the pandemic hit, there's been a real push around connectivity to Julia's point. And that has been consistent, but it really ramped up. And I think there has been a nice consistent focus on trying to close the digital divide. 
Um, but I think that is really breaking into two spaces, right? There is the digital access divide, which is what people tend to think about, which is about getting devices and broadband access to more and more folks. In fact, some states and places are doing the mission accomplished, declaring victory bit on closing that digital divide. But I think we have to be careful to not repeat the challenges of the 90s when we got computers into classrooms, but then they just sat in the back of those classrooms. And there's an additional digital divide that has emerged. And that's much more of the digital use divide. Mm -hmm. So just because you have a device doesn't mean you know how to use it, how to integrate it into your life, how to integrate it into practice as a teacher. And I think we have a lot of work to do in that digital use device space and policy is starting to shift in that direction. And I just want to add something to Chris, what he said about that, that uh, use. It's also like um, Henry Jenkins had a paper out in 2001 from the MacArthur Foundation, which I find is one of my seminal, like I go back to it all the time, but it's about participatory culture, right? How do we make sure everybody has the skills to participate in the spaces that they um, are, have access to so they can affiliate, they can create. If you have those skills, then you can actually participate as a citizen, um, as a productive citizen and everything else. And I think that's the big thing that we need to be equipping students with, right? It doesn't matter what career path you go into, you use technology. And can you use that technology to connect and um, collaborate and be productive? And just one more thing I wanna to point to that. It can't even be a binary measure about whether or not people are using the technology. It also has to be what they're using it for, right? There are a number of studies out there that highlight that, you know, in, in lower income uh, populations, that it's used much more for sort of the digital worksheet type work um, for mm -hmm. students, where in other environments, it's used as a much more interactive and engaging setup. So I think it's not just do you have access and are you using it? But it's also how you're using it and how effectively you're using it that becomes really important. Great point. Uh, Chris, you mentioned states. So since we have the state ed tech director uh, association leader here with us, I'd like to ask Julia, uh, is variation in state policies leading to demonstrably better ed tech experiences for kids in some states? And it's funny we're having a conversation about research because it would be nice to have some research kind of wrapped around that. Um, I, I think for me, what, what I'm seeing is, yes, there is variation, right? Again, the states that continue to invest in their ed tech spaces and digital learning spaces and valuing it as a way to empower and engage students in their classrooms um, have policies in place. I think of a Utah, right, where it really literally felt like they had continued to invest in the space uh, long after uh, Title II Part D went away. And it felt like they were up and running in two weeks after the pandemic hit. Like they literally made the shift and everybody was on their way. And um, Rick Gaisford and his team um, in Utah just were motoring along and everything else where um, everybody else is trying to shift and figure out what parts of the policy pieces were they missing in order to make that shift. Um, but the ed tech space is interesting, right? It's a domain that covers lots of different areas. And depending on where your state priorities are really is where the, the variations do exist, right? Somebody may be very, um, some states might be very focused on one-to-one uh, -one devices and connecting like a Connecticut um, and that sort of thing. Others might be more instructional materials or STEM. Um, and it just, it, 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 it runs the gamut on where we are in the domain space, right? And, and the expertise of the folks. And again, it's political will, right? If you have a legislator that's really passionate about um, specific area, then you have legislation that comes out in there that even may affect the federal space as well, not just the state. So um, it's it's kind of complicated um, just because ed tech does have these different spaces um, and domains that we cover. So are there formal mechanisms in place to gather these lessons learned from the states, analyze them and share them nationwide? Whose responsibility is that or should that be? I, I can't imagine that CETA uh, feels responsible for doing research across the 50 states and the territories to understand who's doing what, what's working. Uh, is, there, is there any movement out there to do that, that that you know of? I mean, I'll jump in. I think it depends a little bit on your definition of ed tech, 
or what part of ed tech you're talking about. So there are some that consider ed tech to be, you know, broadband access devices, sort of the nuts and bolts and the plumbing of things that are going on. There are some that consider it to be more tool oriented. Um, or am I using an assessment system? Am I using a grade book? Um, and there are others that consider it to be more of the broader instructional model and the materials and the activities that happen. I think if you look at that spectrum, the answer is different in different parts of that. There is a lot of tracking going on right now about folks getting access to broadband, about access to Wi-Fi in schools, in homes, and that's being tracked by numerous uh, entities and agencies that the, at the federal level that we pay very close attention to and participate in different aspects of that in conjunction with you know, across agencies, right? FCC is involved in that as well as ED. IES does some work. Um, all in the, those arenas. I think there are um, some surveys and that are much more asking about participation and basic usage when you get to some of the tool space um, area, but it's very limited. It certainly doesn't necessarily get to the full spectrum of what works, though there are some clearing houses out there. And Bart, the EdTech Evidence Exchange is obviously uh, very involved in that. But I think as you move more towards learning models and things like that, that is very, that is much newer and there, there's far less activity there, not even tracked across states, but even within a state. I was going to say there's really not a formal, formal process or processes, you know what I mean? Like we, we sort of have a hodgepodge all over the place. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak for CETA. We try to highlight what states are doing, but it's not really deeply, we're not a research organization, nor do we have a research arm. We're a very small staff that does a lot of things, but um, on behalf of our memberships, but um, it, it would be lovely to have more of that, right? To really have those deep dives um, into either a state perspective or even an LEA. And I know Bart, you we, we've talked before about how there is a need for it. Um, the question is how easy can we make it for folks to collect that research from LEAs and, and everything else to make it part of their process too, without slowing them down or making them feel like they're part of, you know, some science experiment um, in essence, but mm -hmm. that they're, they're, they're lending their experience and whatnot to the greater body of knowledge. Um, and I think also uh, in terms of them being practitioners, right? Again, it's a, it's a space, it's an action research space. How do we create more of that in the classroom so that we can allow for that type of examination to happen and, re and information to be gathered and collected up? Thank you. The only other thing I just wanna add in real quick to that is, I think we have to also evolve the culture around this a bit and make it, um, make it feel safe to gather that information, I think right now many states um, and LEAs feel like it. There is little upside to sharing this information, and it only creates a liability for them. Mm -hmm. um, and until we can reverse that paradigm, so that it becomes more of a we're all in it together, and if you and if such a thing highlights an area of need, that that becomes something to work together to solve, as opposed to something to. Um, try to gloss over in some ways. Yeah. Well, you've put your finger on a very tricky issue, Chris. Right now, if I were implement, seeking to implement a new math program for middle school students in my district, I would love to know how has the program that I'm thinking about implementing been performing in a dozen districts that are very similar to mine. But Nine months later, if I've implemented it and things have not gone so well, I have a pretty strong incentive to keep quiet about that, right? I don't want to embarrass myself or my peers. I don't want finger pointing. And how do we, how do we find, is there a way to find that balance of encouraging people to document their work under the shared understanding that we're all learning and we're making mistakes and we need to learn from each other? Um, when there's so much social and political pressure for them to only highlight their, their successes. Well, I don't also don't want to, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I'm not going to put myself in hot water here, but I also feel like <laughs> the, the vendors are also responsible for part of this as well, right? You want, I want a product, I want a company, an organization, a product, whatever, to be 
engage in that too and be willing to put themselves in that space as well to take some of that responsibility um, to help maybe change the culture. Um, I often am asking like, what's your learning theory that's underneath this thing? Because if you can't answer that question, I don't know if I want you in the space. CETA members are really passionate about, you know, the impact on um, um, kids in the classroom and everything else. And we want what's best, right? But we also want to know that you have done your, your own research in terms of your product. So I don't want to leave it just on the education system side of the house. I also want to like encourage um, vendors and product developers and all of that to be thinking about those things, to be able to answer those questions and engage in that space to test their own products um, as well. Because I think that would help go a long way as, you know what I mean? It's just not our responsibility on our side. Uh, agreed completely. And uh, let's talk about that for a moment and, and talk about the regulatory and research structure for ed tech compared to other sectors of our economy. Drug companies are required to prove that their products are effective before they can sell them to the public. The law literally requires them to pay for clinical trials that must satisfy independent experts. But ed tech companies are under no obligation to do any research before selling their products to schools. And it is arguably not reasonable to require them to do so because of the cost structure. So if companies are not required to do research, how can our nation's 14,000 plus school districts possibly know what works as opposed to what is popular because of great marketing? I guess I'll jump in on that one. I think, Look, we can't pretend that educate, sales and education is different than sales in any other industry, right? Um, so therefore, people are going to try to put their best foot forward. What I think you can do is require people to provide a certain level of disclosure. Um, you can set, you can do that from a regulatory standpoint, or you can do it from sort of a norm setting um, that can happen in, in a particular industry and space um, that really calls for that, right? I think we're starting to see that happen a little bit more in terms of data privacy and student privacy and protections there where more and more people are starting to put some sort of standard in place or raising their hand saying they uh, live up to that particular standard. But I think realistically to ever balance that there has to be some combination of demand for that, mm -hmm. right? And there is demand emerging from that privacy issue. There is not the same demand uh, arising for the effectiveness of different um, of different products and different solutions. I also think it's very different if you're talking about something that's an entire instructional model and something that's basic as, you know, student email, right? Um, I think there are some different mm -hmm. standards to that. So could there be an evolution that tries to create a broader framework and categorization of some of these things so that we could put some different policies or pledges um, or, or regulations in place around that? I think we're going to see that start to emerge um, over time, but maybe right now a little bit more slowly than it naturally would have. Though I do think the pandemic may have sped that up a little bit by creating a little bit more transparency into what's happening for the broader community. Um, but until parents and educators can sort of have that transparency until that demand arises, it's going to be hard to push back against that natural instinct um, for sales in, in, in education. And I think the responsibility here is the leadership and the administration and our systems, though, to be asking those questions, I mean, to raise the demand, right? So if you are in this space, um, you should be asking those questions of those products, not just the slick, you know, marketing thing that came through, but also, you know, asking, and maybe one of the things that we could be creating as a community on the ed side is the types of questions, right? So um, CETA was involved in like, um, working with procurement, right? What kind of questions does procurement need to ask for interoperability? Because they're not the expertise, but maybe we as ed tech folks can say, what kinds of questions should you be asking as you are implementing, right? And I know, Bart, you've done some of this work and everything else, and maybe not as, as a deep dive, but things that they should be saying. I mean, for me, a basic question is, what learning theory are you basing this on? Help me understand if you even understand my space. Because all of those all tech folks know that you have to understand the industry that you're in. And if you really don't understand the industry you're in, I'm hoping as a principal or as a superintendent and whatnot, that I'm asking those questions like, do you even understand what I'm doing here every day with all these kids? Um, and that raises the demand. And then hopefully 
there are some folks that will go first. You know what I mean? Like if we could have some folks that go first in terms of the vendor side saying, I want to engage in this research. I'm going to be open about this. Mm-hmm. And then we can try to, to, to be learners with us, right? They have to show that um, as opposed to just spending the money. But sometimes we do get into places where they have to spend money. You know, it's the end of the year and they want to be able to do stuff. But hopefully um, we do a better thoughtful and mindful questioning about what we're doing and why we're doing it um, so that we don't want to go ahead. I just want to call out that there's um, and I think someone in the chat called this out as well like thinking that that tech is the silver bullet right. I think ed tech is an opportunity it can be a change agent and it's an important ingredient into solutions but it is not the standalone Uh, ingredient to solve all of these problems. And therefore that creates a different challenge of trying to evaluate it as if it is a silver bullet and Mm -hmm. by itself can solve the problem. And I I think that makes your work part particularly challenging given that it depends what else, what other ingredients you put in there. (laughs) Well, it's a hugely important point. I, I, you guys both know this. Uh, I, there's, a number of studies that have been funded by IES, which is the independent research arm of the federal government that look at a product to determine whether it's effective. And unfortunately, it's hard to extrapolate from a successful study to know whether something that worked in Miami is going to work in Raleigh because the schools are so different from each other. And what we're trying to understand through our work is which factors matter. Is it that something was a huge success in Julia's district, uh, but not in mine because her teachers had more agency over the decision or they had sufficient planning time or maybe my teachers um, had too many competing priorities that had something to do with culture. These are all the things that need to be figured out. And uh, so I guess the question I would ask is, if we all agree that our nation's schools need research-based evidence to support their ed tech purchase and implementation decisions, who should do that research? Who should pay for it? Individual districts? Uh, it, the, the vendors generally don't pay for expensive, complicated, slow, uh, and risky independent research. So do we want that? And if so, who should do it? I don't know. I'm about like maximizing things here. I feel like there should be some efforts at the federal level. There could be some um, collaboration among states that are alike, in essence, um, in terms of policy or even size and um, and, and makeup, that sort of thing. But um, I do think there's got to be some sort of bigger thing. It just can't be one state. I don't think it should just be on the individual districts, right? Unless a district that's their thing, um, it won't it won't inform the greater body of knowledge um, for us to share out. And I feel like we need to set a model. You know what I mean? We need to be role models and say this is important, and we want we want to see stuff in this space. So again, signaling that that is important. How do we do that? Let me close with the final question about policy and accountability. The scary data that we've all seen shows that our schools often buy things that they then fail to use properly or sometimes at all. Some estimates show that 85% of ed tech is wasted in this way. Should we consider experimenting with requiring schools and or companies to publicly report on actual versus expected usage of ed tech products? You know, I was reading this question. I was still like trying to, was trying to process it in some ways. I, I think it's hard because I think of like a drafting like class, right? There's such a small number of kids are going to use like maybe that drafting software and how and everything else. And, and in the grand scheme of things, I still want to buy it because those kids are interested in drafting and they're doing that stuff and, and, and whatnot, like CTE, right? But then there's right. other things that everybody's using, right? An LMS or... Uh, um, and that's a different thing too, because that's more on the productivity side and collaboration and communication side. What really is in that space to do instruction, like helps the instructional um, practice, like creating an experience for kids to, to, to connect to the content. Um, again, it's, it's, it, it depends on what we're using the technology for and the ed tech for and what function it's being used in the schools. Um, and, and just because, you know, a number of kids use it more than other kids, does that mean it's not effective? I, I mean, it's trying to parse it all out and it's still a pretty complex um, 
system and, and, and everything else. Chris, do you have anything that you want to add to that one? Because I remember reading yeah. that question going, oh, I don't know how to answer this one sometimes. <laughs> Look, I would say at this point, putting up more barriers to adoption um, isn't necessarily what I think we need to do um, or where we need to focus. I Would inf additional information be helpful? Yes. Would, um, you know, do I want to see it wasted? No, but I don't think the waste that's coming from the purchasing is the biggest challenge right now. I think it's knowing how to use it effectively and knowing when to use it effectively. And I would want to focus more on those challenges before I tried to focus on the solving the waste problem. Because I do think you need to have access to certain things. And I believe that the more that we find people, we can help people effectively use things, we'll probably see more usage as well. And that the first problem may substantially help take care of the second problem. Great. Well, we're out of time. I'll give you each the last word. Julia, uh, thoughts on uh, policy and the future of ed tech. Are you optimistic overall? Do you have a highest priority, something you want to see done? Uh, I am optimistic. I feel um, that the pandemic has given us a, a, a moment in time that we have not had before in terms of this space. And um, I mean, there's multiple things happening. Of course, for CETA right now, we've been focused on the connectivity and, and the area which I affectionately call nerd toast. I know Bart, you call it the plumbing, but if we don't have secure and, and safe networks and access for folks, the rest of it doesn't matter, right? We can't, we can't do what we need to be able to do in that professional learning and instructional space. So I know that that's a priority for us and I see us getting there. I do, um, again, it won't happen tomorrow, but I do see us getting to that, that place, um, it's cracking the instructional side um, and really helping figure out how we do that better uh, is, is a long-term challenge. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get in, we'll, we'll dig into it pretty soon here. But I, I, I do have optimism and I'm excited about it. Good. Chris, same question to you. Uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. I think um, I wouldn't have taken this post <laughs> if, if I wasn't. I think, look, the term ed tech it means, as I said before, means a lot of different things. So do I, am I more hopeful in some aspects of it than other aspects of it? Sure. But the reality is that technology is integrating into so many, nearly all aspects of our lives. Education won't be able to stay out of that mix um, for much longer. And the pandemic did speed that up. So to me, it becomes not a question of if, it becomes more about how effectively um, how well we do it and how many people we can serve. And if we can speed up the effectiveness of that um, without sort of, and minimize the stumbling blocks that can happen, that's what I see the mission being for these upcoming years. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, we, we really value your perspectives and all the work that you're doing on behalf of trying to improve the system. It's very complex and interconnected and dysfunctional, but we are moving in the right direction uh, because of people like you and so many in the audience who are working day in and day out to improve the system. Thank you for joining us, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.